here in the front. Okay, um, we don't have enough Malaysians in here for anyone to get the jokes, unfortunately. But um, this talk is going to be like I had to do a last minute change. Uh, I was going to do this whole thing on anti forensics, but none of my code actually works. And so what I decided to do was to do what I know best. So this is going to be called Panduan uh, Menchari Gadis Malam by uh, Papa Ayam. All right, there's three people laughing. Uh, for everyone else, that means the guide to finding women of the night. <laughs> Pengantar. Okay. Gadis Malam. Di mana? Umur berapa? Berapa? Terlampau mahal. <laughs> okay. So, uh, for everyone else that just said uh, where, how old, how much, incredibly expensive. <laughs> so, um, onto, the, onto the actual presentation. It's called uh, How the Leopard Hides a Spot, because I assumed everyone here from Malaysia is familiar with, you know, classical colonial literature by Richard Kipling, right? Okay, so uh, the idea is that this is a talk on anti forensics specifically for the OSX platform. Uh, as it happened, I spent quite a lot of time working on application level file format attacks. So um, a lot of this is actually cross platform. Like we'll spend some time looking at HFS specific attacks, but also uh, things we can do against, uh, for example, SQL Lite. Uh, briefly, an introduction of myself. Uh, my name is The Grug. Um, I've been an anti-forensics researcher since 1999, which basically makes me the longest running anti-forensics researcher in a field of about two people. Um, <laughs> I'm number one. <laughs> uh, I, I basically work as an independent security researcher, which is the, the nice term for hacker, uh, and I live in Thailand, so I'm quite close to here. So I'm not jet lagged, unlike everyone else, which is awesome. Um, a lot of people ask me why I do anti-forensics. Um, uh, actually, the, the specific example I have for this is when I, I gave an earlier version of uh, this talk, my, my old one on Unix, to a uh, police conference. I had this very, very big, like two meter tall, shaved head guy with his name on his knuckles come up and, and say, like, I've got one question. I'm like, yes. He goes, why are you doing this? Um, police don't like it when you make their job difficult. They really, they really hate it. And, the, the problem, as I see it, is that forensics is actually an integral part of the information security life cycle, right? From penetration testing, intrusion prevention, intrusion detection, incident response, forensics, it's all part of the security life cycle. And as a result, it should be exposed to the same sorts of research as other parts of the security life cycle, such as finding bugs and other pieces of software. So unless someone's doing this, then forensics is never actually going to catch up and it's going to continue to remain uh, vulnerable and insecure. Uh, the other thing is that it's, it's still very much greenfield research. Like, if you're looking at doing buffer overflows on Windows, you may as well just spend your time reading everyone else's papers and following in their footsteps, because it's going to be really hard to do something new. But if you're doing anti-forensics, you basically just pick a platform, and anything you do is the first what, is like the first stuff that's ever been done on it. It's really easy. Um, it's great. It's like kicking someone when they're down. Uh, okay, so. Now to get everyone on the same page, you get a one slide introduction to digital forensic analysis. Okay, the first thing to know is that forensics only exists within the context of an investigation. So anything that's like done to just look around doesn't count as forensics, right? Forensics only exists within the context of an investigation. You're responding to an incident. Uh, you're investigating that incident and then drawing some sort of conclusion. Uh, there's only about three things you need to do. You need to preserve the data in the original state. You need to extract all the evidentiary data possible from that uh, snapshot of the original state, and then you need to present the evidence, right? Piece of piss. Um, we're going to be looking at all of the things that happen at step two, where you extract the evidentiary data from the snapshot. So let's look at that as anti-forensics. Uh, anti-forensics gets a two-slide introduction because it's a lot more complicated. Slide number one, data is evidence, right? Everything that you can possibly do on a system leave some sort of trace behind, right? Everything that you do in some way affects, creates data that needs to be removed or hidden, right? So your goal when doing anti-forensics is to reduce the quantity and quality of, ev of evidentiary data. 
And there's several different ways of doing that. So there's uh, basically three types of strategy that you can employ. First off, we have data destruction, right? They can't find what isn't there. So if you destroy the data, there's nothing to be recovered and used against you in a court of law. What this comes down to is basically removing evidentiary data ex post facto, which means after the fact. Uh, I looked it up on Google. Um, <laughs> so the idea is that after you've done something that you're not very proud of, you get rid of the evidence completely by destroying absolutely everything. It's very difficult to do this in a subtle way. Like, it's very difficult to only remove part of a file system. Um, part of the reason of that is modern systems scatter data absolutely everywhere, right? When you download a file, there's like a cache. It might update the registry on a Windows machine. It'll be written to disk in multiple different locations. That will create directory entries. That will update uh, inode times. Uh, like, all sorts of things happen all over the place. And, and finding and tracking down each of these instances and reverting them to a state prior to uh, you know, the bad thing, that's actually incredibly difficult to do. So generally speaking, uh, the scorched earth policy is the way to go. What that means is just fucking burn it all. Right? Don't try and get rid of like, only the, the dirty pictures you downloaded. Just destroy the hard disk. Get a hammer out. Go at it. That's the way to do it. You're, like, really, doing, doing proper data st destruction is very difficult. Um, Fortunately, in the real world, you don't actually have to do proper data destruction. You, you, you just need to do like, just enough to make a forensics investigation difficult. So you don't need to destroy all evidence. You just need to make the evidence uh, useless in the court of law. So demonstrating that it's been modified is generally sufficient. But like, we're hackers, so we're far cooler than that. So no data destruction for us. All right? So that's strategy one. Strategy two, data hiding. All right? If they can't see it, they can't find it. So we're going to stick our stuff somewhere they can't see it, where the sun don't shine. Uh, the idea is to store data outside of the scope of the investigator's tools. So if your data is stored beyond their visibility range, it's secure. Um, the problem is it's only secure for a short period of time. Like basically, you're, you're dealing with bug death. So uh, when you're exploiting a bug, you don't have an infinite period of time before that bug dies. It's just like everything else on the internet. Uh, the good thing is forensics is a very, very slow moving uh, field. So uh, when I first did a, a release of a bug back in like 2002, there was the uh, RuneFS, which basically just used the bad blocks file. Uh, it took the sleuth kit nine months to fix what was essentially a one line patch. All right? So bug death is a very, very slow process. You don't really need to worry about it that much. It's not like hours like on the internet. It's, you know, Possibly years, but anyway. Um, so yeah, because you need to worry about bug death, don't forget to encrypt, All right? So there we go, data destruction, data hiding. Next one, data contraception. They can't find what was never there in the first place, All right? So the trick with this is you never touch the disk, All right? Um, the, the idea is if you don't create evidentiary data, you don't have to remove it and you don't have to hide it. So you stay in RAM, uh, you avoid accessing things that will um, lead back to you. You avoid using tools which are custom made. You use tools which are generic so that it's very hard to create a profile. So it's very hard to trace you down to a specific individual. Um, the problem with this is it's a real pain in the ass to do, uh, particularly if you're drunk. Um, so like you really have to plan and be, be prepared. You can't just go out and like just start hacking whatever you feel like. You have to like, okay, Today I'm going to be going after this, like here's the plan, you script everything out beforehand, you get your tools ready, and then you execute. And you know, it, it, uh, most people don't really do that. Um, I, I wrote a tool to make it a lot easier by uh, allowing you to script interactions with the command line. Uh, that tool is called Hash. Uh, you can download it from uh, tacvoip.com. Um, but generally speaking, like doing, doing proper data contraception is very annoying. Right? So those are the three strategies that you can employ. Uh, now we're going to be looking at tactics, ways that we can actually implement them. Uh, we're only actually going to be looking at data hiding attacks because they're far sexier than the other ones. Like data destruction is easy, you just destroy everything. Uh, data contraception is hard and annoying, um, and I did it last year. And so let's do something that like, involves like reading source code and finding bugs and, and writing code. So, when we're, when we're looking at a good data hiding attack, there's only really two things we need to worry about. First of all, it has to be hidden. Right? If it's not hidden, it's not a data hiding attack. 
you'd be surprised how much this foils people. Um, I remember working with a guy who, who told me that his clever technique for hiding systems on Unix was to put a dot in front of the name. Uh, it actually worked, that's the sad thing. But <laughs> like when, when we do pen tests and we find uh, rootkits, we find that they usually don't even bother with the dot. They just pick a home directory for someone who hasn't logged in for a year and stuff all their stuff in there. No one cares. All right, so uh, we're, we're not that blatant. We want to do something clever. We're going to go for a hidden attack. The other thing is we want it to be robust, which means that when we put our data in there, when we come back to pull it out, it shouldn't have changed and be destroyed or, or gone lost, all right? So we don't want our, our data to vanish. If we wanted our data to vanish, we would use a data destruction attack, all right? Um, so what we're going to be looking at specifically is ways of exploiting structured, sp uh, structured storage bugs. Uh, structured storage is pretty fundamental to computers. Uh, everyone's intimately familiar with all sorts of structured storage approaches. Yes? I can just skip the next section. Okay, what the hell? Yeah, th there's one person in the audience who, who says I should go for it. Okay, so uh, our, the first sort of structured storage we're going to look at is file systems. Uh, file systems are basically a way of uh, pairing user data with names. That's all they do. The way that they implement it uh, is, is a bit more complicated. So the idea is that you take a discrete stream of data and you associate a human readable name with it. And then you can create a path with a number of these names and you get to that specific piece of data. Right? That's all it does. The way that it implements it on disk uh, is what we're going to be, be spending most of our time looking at. Um, there's two types of data within the file system. There's data which we completely ignore because data belongs to the user and it changes all the time. And then there's metadata. Metadata is used to organize the file system, right? To organize the internal structure of that structured storage medium. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, so file systems, uh, this is another one. Uh, file systems basically provide an uh, operating system level of CRUD, which is create, read, update, delete. Obviously, right? Uh, I'll take that blank stare as a yes. Okay. Uh, files have basically four critical components. Uh, all sorts of files use different names for them, but they basically, the file systems basically break down into only four types of objects, right? There's a header, which basically tells you the, the, the global layout and properties of that file system. That has to be at a fixed location so you can find it. Anything else can be created dynamically, but you have to be able to find the header, right? Then you have a block. A block is just a, a discrete chunk of data. It's going to be the lowest atomic addressable component of that file system, right? Then you have a node. A node is a collection of metadata for a single file plus one or more block streams, which, so a block stream is basically an ordered series of blocks containing data, right? So you've got your block list, you've got your node, and then you have a map. So what a map does is it takes a name and it pairs it with a node, right? So to make this concrete, I'll give everyone examples from NTFS because you are all intimately familiar with the internal structure of the NTFS file system, right? Once again, the blank stare of <laughs> affirmation. <laughs> okay, so the header on uh, an NTFS system is called the boot block for historical reasons. Um, a block is called a cluster. Uh, there's usually four letters that comes afterwards, but I'll leave those out because there's ladies in the audience. Um, so basically, a, a, a cluster is the idea is that there are multiple sectors put together as a cluster of sectors. It makes it easier to read large portions of data off the disk. Um, there's some other stuff to go into. Uh, a node is actually an entry within what's called the master file table. Um, the master file table is itself a file that has entries for itself. And then uh, there's maps, which would be directory files, as you know them. But they're actually also entries within the master file table, which makes it a lot clearer, I can see, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. This one might work a bit better. FAT, right? Everyone's familiar with the FAT file system. It's used on all your mobile phones, right? It's everywhere. Uh, the, the file system that will not die. Uh, it's older than I am. It's from like the, the early 70s. It's a fucking abomination, similar to myself. But um, the idea is that there's this boot block which describes the entire file system, and that's the first sector of the disk. A block is once again called a cluster. A node is a directory entry. So inside a directory file, there's actually uh, additional metadata associated with that file name. And then there's a fat chain, which is within the fat table itself. There's a chain of blocks, which creates the block list for user data. And then finally, your map is itself 
a directory file, right? 